So this time of this time of year, we are celebrating the original novena, those nine days between our Lord's ascension last Thursday and the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost Sunday. And so let us pray again this prayer to the Holy Spirit in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, take such possession of us that we may be as apostles, all on fire with divine love, and may speak with new tongues, so that all that hear us may be touched and edified. May God bless us and fill us with his sevenfold gifts. Amen. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray, pray for us. us. Our Holy Father, St. Dominic, pray, pray for us. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray, pray for us. And Louis Marie de Montfort. Yay. Pray, Pray for, us. for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, a uh, very good afternoon to all of you in the Far East. And uh, I hear it's very, very hot over there. Uh, we have beautiful sunny weather here this morning as well, but uh, nowhere near as hot, I suppose. It's 12 degrees according to the, according to Alexa, it's 12 degrees, but I don't believe her. I think it must be about 16 right now. <laughs> but it's a beautiful morning wherever we are because we are here together on this final Saturday in May, the month of our Blessed Mother. We are looking forward to our final rosary procession this Saturday. So if you're anyone here who's listening in from London who can make it to London tonight, uh, we have our final rosary procession tonight. I just want to quickly, as usual, go through uh, some of the questions that were asked of us. And I'm going to just pull up the chat box because I might put some links in there. Okay, so hopefully you all know how to uh, check out your chat, chat boxes. Okay. Um, the first question is about membership of the Rosary Confraternity. Now, there is, of course, only one confraternity of the Holy Rosary, but there are different places around the world that enroll people into the, into the confraternity. And you don't have to live in the UK to enroll, of course. Anyone in the world can enroll to the confraternity. But uh, just for administrative purposes, it's uh, preferred, I think, that you enroll uh, in a country that's near you uh, so that, you know, there is a particular church near you that you can go to uh, to pray the rosary on certain special feast days and so on. Uh, of course, I would love to enroll all of you in the UK so you'd be forced to come here in October uh, for the Feast of the Holy Rosary. But I don't think it's the most practical thing to do. So if you're living in Malaysia or you're living in Singapore, probably the closest uh, country for you would be the Philippines, okay? So you should enroll in the Philippines. And uh, I'm going to uh, recommend that you contact the friars in the, in, in the Philippines. Um, now I should have done this beforehand. I had it up, um, here we are. I'm just going to pull up the name of the person that you should contact. Just give me a second as I get this up. Okay. If you need any other names, because let's say you're in Australia, for example, and so on, you can let me know. Uh, I have uh, a few addresses here. But here is the person in the Philippines. Here's his email, and his name is Father uh, Roger Kirao, I think, Q-U-I-R-A-O-O-P. Okay, and that's coming across to you on your chat box now. Uh, his email address, O-G-I-E-Q-O-P at yahoo.com.ph. I've typed that into the chat box, so do have a look at that, okay? Anyone, as I said, can join the Rosary Confraternity. You just have to be, uh, well, anyone who's a Catholic can join the Rosary Confraternity. Um, preferably, you should be over the age of seven, because over the age of reason, as the church understands it. Uh, and you uh, can, can, all you have to do is you commit to saying 15 decades of the Rosary every week, 15 decades a week only. So it's, it's not very much. Okay, and there's no subscription fee, uh, nothing at all. Just have to pray the rosary 15 decades a week for the intentions of the rosary confraternity. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, I was asked about the uh, first Saturday devotions, that means the act of reparation to the Blessed Virgin Mary and what that is about. Um, in brief, Our Lady uh, appeared to Sister Lucia, uh, one of the missionaries of Fatima, not in 1913, but I think it was around 1925 and asked her to promote this. Our Lady had already promised at Fatima in 1917 that she was going to ask for these first Saturdays of reparation. To make reparation for something is to basically uh, perform an act of love uh, to make up for the lack of love and the indifference and the coldness of others towards Our Lady's Immaculate Heart, towards Our Lady's uh, many graces that she mediates to us from Christ. That is the uh, idea of reparation. There's also the idea of reparation to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which is extremely important. Um, and reparation to the Immaculate Heart, of course, is subordinated that follows, follows after reparation to the Sacred Heart. This is to give to God, offer to God our time, our energies, our love, our devotion, as a way of making up for the lack of love of others in the world, okay? That's in brief what it is. Now, the details of it all, I'm sending you another link. Okay, you can look it up online easily, First Saturday Devotion, but I'm sending you a link, which I think is trustworthy from my publishers, CTS Books. Okay, so that should have come through in the chat box for you as well. Um, it, just in case anyone is not able to look in the chat box, doesn't know how to, uh, perhaps uh, Agnes could make a note of all this or, or somebody in the, in the organizing team, just make a note of all these links and then you can send it out later on, okay? Um, okay. Another question I'm asked is, uh, you know, are there any meditations that are recommended or available? Uh, I mean, there's no shortage of, of meditations available. There are videos even that will help and so on. And there are books you can buy. Of course, I recommend uh, when you can get it, a copy of my book, Mysteries Made Visible. But uh, for example, I'm gonna share with you another link from the Vatican in English of their rosary meditations. And it's just a short passage of scripture. And of course, scripture is a wonderful uh, and, and indispensable uh, meditation aid for the rosary, right? Because the rosary is entirely scriptural in some way. So we need to draw from the scriptures and learn from the scriptures and meditate on God's word. And the rosary is our way of praying with the word of God, of meditating on the mysteries of salvation revealed to us in the Bible. So I've shared with you here from the Vatican, uh, some of their scripture meditations to accompany the rosary. And there's some beautiful illustrations from classical art that go with that presentation online as well. So you can use sacred art to pray the rosary and read those words of scripture. More about praying with art in the talk today, okay. Um, another question I was asked is uh, an important question. Okay, I'm reading, I'll read the question aloud. Pertaining to what Christianity is about, God became man so that man might become God. What do you mean by so that man might become God? If God is the creator of all things, how could his creatures, human beings, become God through the passion of, through the passion, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ? How do the mysteries of the rosary contribute to this process? I mean, so that man might become God. Now, let us make the last, let me just answer the last bit, right? How do the mysteries of the rosary contribute to this process? If I understand the question correctly, it's asking me how the mysteries of the rosary, which is Christ's passion, death, resurrection, and ascension, can contribute to the process of our becoming divinized. Now, if that's what the question means, if that's what the question means, then I hope that uh, what I'm going to say next will make it very clear, because obviously it is through Christ and through Christ's passion, death, resurrection, and ascension that we can be united to God it is only through Christ. So it is through the mysteries which we meditate on in the rosary that we can be united to Christ. It's not the rosary itself, it's not the praying of the rosary itself that unites us to Christ, no. no. It's the mysteries that the rosary point to. It is the work of Jesus Christ, his saving action that enables us to be divinized. That's the first point I wanna make clear, okay? The rosary in itself 
as a set of beads or as a way of prayer is not necessarily salvific because it's not, it's not a sacrament after all. It is only a sacramental, it's a devotion, it's a way of prayer. Only the work of Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, only the work of Jesus Christ can save us. Only the work of Jesus Christ can divinize us. Only the work of Jesus Christ can unite us to God. That's the first thing I want to make very, very clear. Okay. The second thing is that, as I often say, read your catechism. If you read the catechism, you will see that it is in the catechism that it is, it is explained to us what we mean by becoming like God. Okay. Now, it is impossible, of course, for a creature to become like the creator. There is a chasm uh, that divides the creature, us creatures, from the creator. God, as the creator, is uncreated. He has always been. There was never a time when he was not. Whereas we creatures come into being, we are created. And we draw our life, our essence, our being from God. God simply exists and we draw existence from him. So of course, there is a fundamental difference in, in category and in essence and in being between us and God. Therefore, we cannot become God, absolutely speaking, first thing. Second thing, St. Thomas Aquinas points out, almost in jest, he says, of course, nobody wants to become God, because if we become God absolutely, then we lose our own identity, and then we cease to exist. So he says, clearly, that's not what we mean by saying that we become God. So third thing, what does it mean then to say God became man so that man might become God? The fathers of the church uh, stress that we become like God because we have charity. Charity, charity, or divine love, if you want to call it that, is a participation in God's being, in how God is. God, as St. John tells us, God is love or a better translation would be, God is charity. Now, if you guys haven't read it yet, I recommend to you Deus Caritas Est, the first encyclical of Pope Benedict XVI. Absolutely wonderful to read. And if you want to understand what we mean by charity, what we mean by loving our neighbor, really active works of love, and how being loving and acting with love makes us like God, then we should read Deus Caritas Est, okay? But in a nutshell, charity is what we call a theological virtue. That means that it cannot be uh, caused by human beings alone. We cannot earn it in a sense, right? We cannot learn it. It's not like uh, the virtue of fortitude, which, which is courage and bravery by exercise. Uh, we can actually learn to be brave, but charity cannot be learned in that way. Charity is the theological virtue, which means that it's given by God, okay? And it is given by God at our baptism and is increased in us if we are in a state of grace. That means we haven't fallen into mortal sin. It is increased in us through the sacraments, particularly through the Eucharist. Charity increases in the soul. And again, we have to go to mass with the right dispositions, worthy dispositions, open to his action, open to the work of the Holy Spirit. And every time we pray, come Holy Spirit, we're asking for an increase in that divine love. Okay. And what that does is over a period of time, we grow in charity so that we learn to love more and love better. We learn to love like God. And we know that Jesus often teaches us what it means to love like God, because he says to us, you know, if you love those who love you, if you do good to those who could do good to you, if you invite, you know, your friends and your neighbors to, to your meal, to your table, and that's it, then you are no better than the pagans. Why does he say that phrase? You're no better than the, you're just like the pagans. You know, he says, what thanks do you expect for that? What does he mean by that phrase? You're just like the pagans. He's not trying to be insulting. <laughs> He's saying that means that God's grace hasn't made any difference to you, hasn't changed you. We do not see charity in your life. 
So how does a Christian behave? Again, look at the Beatitudes of our Lord, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who suffer for the sake of righteousness and justice. You know, all these things that our Lord says show us in a practical way the work of charity in our lives. So when you see someone like that, who does these things for the love of God and the love of Jesus Christ, you can say they have charity in their soul and they become like Jesus. They truly become like Jesus. Jesus is the one who, when he is crucified by those who hate him, who knowingly crucify him, he can say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. He makes excuses for those who hurt him and kill him. Charity, charity is being able to love those who hate us. It is being able to give, to turn the other cheek when we are being injured and so on. It's demanding. And that's why it's called a theological virtue. It doesn't come from my own powers. It doesn't come from, uh, from practice. It cannot be put on. It comes from God. Okay. Now, I want to share with you a link again, so you can read a bit more about this theologically. I've been talking about it scripturally and practically, but let's, I'm going to share this with you so you can have a look at this theologically. Okay. And you can have a read of that. But this process of divinization, as it's called divinization, is essential to what it means to live the Christian life. i just read for you this little passage, okay? In the tradition of the Holy Fathers, the primary goal of the Christian spiritual life is active and dynamic participation in the divine life. Such participation is called divinization, in Greek, theosis. For the Holy Fathers, spiritual struggle is the primary path to divinization. The first stage of this spiritual asceticism is the purgative stage. It is purification from the passions, passions means the emotions, and our passionate intentions through the power and grace of the Holy Spirit. Roughly speaking, I call this dying to ourselves. The second stage, the illuminative stage, is the illumination of the mind and contemplation or vision of God. Okay, illuminative stage. You might call this, uh, Jesus says, deny yourselves, pick up your cross and follow me. So the illuminative stage is following Christ, being drawn by his example and seeing his example with greater clarity. And the third stage, the final stage, is the unitive stage or the actual attainment of divinization. Unitive stage because we are united with, to, to God with, by charity so that we love what he loves and we do as he does. And God loves all people, even those who harm us. So when we're able to do that, we are very close to that unitive stage. Now, these three, these three stages of the spiritual life, the purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive are the classic uh, ways of spiritual perfection, of becoming like God, that is written about by all the great masters of the church from the very beginning right until this day. Uh, the best writers of this would be, well, best examples anyway of these writers would be St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, the great Carmelite mystics. If you've never heard of this before, then uh, it's time to schedule a talk, a series of talks just on this particular aspect, because if we do not grasp these three steps of our spiritual journey, then you know, we are at a great deficit. And, and I do believe that maybe part of the problem today in the church is that many people have never even heard of this part, these, this, these steps of spiritual perfection, that our Christian discipleship, our following of Christ involves these purgative, illuminative and unitive stages, okay? So I'm just mentioning it here as too much to go into in this time. Okay, so I'm just going to move on very quickly. Um, there's a question about how to teach uh, my daughter-in-law and my grandson to pray the rosary, uh, even though they're not Catholics. Well, I'll talk about that maybe a little bit later on in, in the main body of the talk today. Um, there's an interesting question on, you know, how can one meditate on the mysteries of the rosary when one is driving or walking, since one should be concentrating on the traffic? 
we can only recite the rosary but can't meditate. Is that actually true? I feel that a lot of people seem to be able to do a lot of things whilst they're driving. Um, people listen to the radio, they talk to one another, they have arguments. Uh, they're able to engage in quite a lot of things, uh, even though at some level they're concentrating on the traffic, of course. Um, I think maybe uh, the misunderstanding is what we mean by meditate. Some people, maybe in the East as well, we think that meditating means that you're sitting in a room, you have to hold your fingers in a particular way, and you kind of go, om, and we're just totally concentrated in our minds. Well, that's one view of meditation, but the word meditate means to just chew on an idea, basically, right? To cogitate on something, to chew on an idea, and to play around with it in our minds. In the scriptures, they say that Mary pondered these things in her heart right? That's in the gospel of St. Luke. Mary pondered these things in her heart. Now, Mary can ponder these things in her heart whilst she's being a mother, whilst she's going about her housework. Uh, I don't think it's impossible that we can do things whilst meditating on the scriptures. And one of the reasons that uh, the monks would pray the Psalms by memory is that so that when they went about their daily tasks, they would still be meditating on the words of scripture throughout the day. It's about images and ideas coming to mind. That's what we mean by meditate. Now, don't tell me that when you're driving or you're walking, you are so concentrated on where your footsteps are going or how your car is driving that you don't have anything else coming to mind. I find that really very hard to believe. So, you know, to meditate just means to bring things to mind. And as St. Thomas Aquinas says, and I said this last week, read the transcript or read my text if in case you've forgotten. But St. Thomas says that you don't have to be totally concentrated 100% of the time, so long as your intention is set on the right thing, which is to meditate uh, or to think about God and to love God and want to love him more, okay? So uh, just gonna leave that there for now. Uh, moving on, there was a question, quite a long question really, on basically consecration to God and what that means. Um, there's quite a lot to go into, uh, but roughly speaking, to consecrate oneself, and generally speaking, to con yeah, it is oneself that is consecrated, means to entrust oneself to God and to set oneself apart for God and for his purposes. Okay. Now, the question is, uh, can we consecrate uh, nations that are not willing to be consecrated? Well, the consecration of nations uh, is, I think, a complicated matter, but it surely means that all those who are willing in that country are entrusted to God. So recently, for example, the UK, uh, England was entrusted or consecrated to Mary in 2020. And some people were saying, well, most of the UK is not Catholic. Most of them are not even believers in, in religion in any way. Uh, what does it mean to consecrate the country to Mary? It means that all of us who trust in God, who believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior, and who love the Blessed Virgin Mary, his mother, uh, we do that act of consecration. And we are doing this on behalf of others. We mustn't think that we are unable to pray for others or that we're unable to do things for the nation. Remember when I talk about reparation, I'm doing an act of love in reparation in place of those who do not love, right? One of the Fatima prayers is about doing that, right? We pray for those who do not love, do not believe, do not hope, right? And remember, we are called to be a priestly people by our baptism and in the word of scripture. We are a priestly people, a consecrated nation, set apart, a people set apart for the glories of God as Christians. Therefore, as a priestly people, we are called to, and it's our duty to intercede for the nations. It is our duty, therefore, to consecrate the world that we live in to God. Okay, so consecration is extremely important in that sense. It is part of our Christian duty. And thirdly then, what do we mean by consecration to Our Lady? Um, I read from the Vatican's directory on popular piety. Louis de, Saint Louis de Montfort is one of the great masters of the spirituality underlying the acts of consecration to Mary. 
he proposed to the faithful consecration to Jesus through Mary, okay, to Jesus through Mary, as an effective way of living out their baptismal commitment. Seen in the light of Christ's words, the act of consecration is a conscious recognition of the singular role of Mary in the mystery of Christ and of the church, of the universal and exemplary importance of her witness to the gospel, of trust in her intercession, and of the efficacy of her patronage, of the many maternal functions she has, since she is a true mother in the order of grace to each and every one of her children. Those of you in the previous week who asked me about the term order of grace, here it is again. The Vatican and the Holy See, you know, the church, the catechism often uses this phrase about Mary. She is our mother in the order of grace, okay? It should be recalled, however, that the term consecration is used here in a broad and non-technical sense. The expression is used of consecrating children to Our Lady, by which is intended placing children under her protection and asking her maternal blessing for them. Some suggest the use of alternative terms such as entrustment or gift to Mary. Okay. Uh, I think that's all I have to say at this point on this matter. I'm gonna move on then to the final question, okay. Um, the final question um, is basically, I'm going to just read the last line. Given the difficulty we have reciting and meditating at the same time, can we not alternate them, um, alternate different ways of praying, I think. Um, and this is what I have to say on this. I was asked this once for a, by a Catholic newspaper here in the UK, and this is what I wrote. This, the problem of spiritual multitasking is something that I used to worry about, especially when I was a recent convert to Catholicism trying to learn to say the rosary. I found it so complicated that I gave it up. Today, I worry less about focusing on the words of the Hail Mary since these should be well known and need not be concentrated upon as such. Rather, as Chesterton says, each Hail Mary is like a child saying again and again to his mother, I love you. And I like to think that the decade of Hail Marys indicates the recommended duration spent meditating on each mystery. They help us to keep time rather than demand our attention and nor should they distract us from the mysteries of salvation being contemplated. Because as St. Thomas Aquinas says, the aim of prayer is to stir us up to greater love and devotion towards God. And so long as our intention in praying is to contemplate the mysteries of God's love for us in order to achieve this aim, then it matters little if we focus on or can even hear the words being said. Sister Lucia of Fatima, one of the three children who saw Our Lady of the Rosary once said, to pray the rosary is something everybody can do, rich and poor, wise and ignorant, great and small. It seems to me that one can over-intellectualize the rosary when instead what matters is that we respond to Our Lady's request with filial devotion and commit to saying the rosary daily. In time I found it, if we fully entrust ourselves to Mary and give her this time of prayer, she will lead us to contemplate the mysteries fruitfully. And let me explain to you what I mean when I say that the 10 Hail Marys uh, indicates a recommended duration of time. We live in a world where we calculate time with a watch and we can tell the time based on you know, what our computer's telling us or what our mechanical devices are telling us. We're used to having clocks and watches, but clocks and watches are a fairly recent invention in the history of mankind. We used to tell the time through the, through the movement of the sun in the sky. And that was how we told the time. It was only when monks began to pray the divine office at set times that they needed to be able to make very accurate time telling devices. And they would ring the bells at the right time. And that's how the people, the ordinary people would know that it was time for a particular action. So when they hear the Angelus bell, they say, ah, it's midday, it's time to pray. When they hear the bell in the evening, oh, it's Vespers time, the monks are going to pray, so it's time to finish our work. That's how they knew time, because they heard the bells ringing. And then they would say, uh, and you hear this in the Bible. In the Bible, uh, we're told that the apostles walked um, to, let's say, Emmaus, right? We know the distance to Emmaus because 
on the Sabbath day, and they were told it was a Sabbath and they walked such a distance, we know that on the Sabbath day, they were only allowed to walk something like 20 miles. And we know if it tells you they got there by, by the, the day's end, it tells you that it took them, you know, tw they walked 20 miles from, let's say, noon to, day, to, the, to sunset. In other words, the Bible t indicates to us um, that they indicate to us the passage of time based on how long it took them to walk somewhere. That's not a way we're used to thinking of. But if I said to you, um, I sometimes say, uh, they'll say to me, how far is it to the market from your priory, from where you live? And I'll say, it takes me about five, hail, um, five decades of the rosary to get there. Or I'll say, yeah, I can say two decades in the time it takes me to walk to the barber shop. And that's because when I'm walking to the barber shop, I start praying the rosary. And when I get to the barber shop, I say, oh, okay, I've finished saying two decades. And that led me to realize that in fact, for most people in the past, we didn't tell the time by saying, oh, it takes five minutes. They tell the time by saying that it took a certain amount of time or you could do a certain number of things in the time it took to walk the distance. I hope that's reasonably clear. So when I say that something takes 10 Hail Marys or one decade, roughly speaking, that's about, let's say three to five minutes. That's what we're talking about. But instead of saying three to five minutes, I say it takes 10 Hail Marys, okay? Um, in the breviary, the prayers of the, church, uh, of the priests and, and the nuns and so on, the breviary, the prayer book, it often tells you to kneel down on the ground or to, to prostrate yourself. And it says, for the duration of one Our Father. So the time it takes you to say one Our Father. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to leave that there. And we better start on the talk. Otherwise, we're not going to get to the end. I'm going to answer this last question that's just turned up. Um, when someone claims to be a consecrated single person, what does it actually mean? Somebody who is a consecrated person is someone who has made a vow, public vow, that is recognized by the bishop and therefore recognized by the whole church, that this person has set themselves aside to the worship of God and dedicated their, their uh, celibacy and their chastity to God, to serving only God and not having a family and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm a consecrated person, okay? Um, again, questions like this, which are really about the teaching of the church, you can Google it and look it up online, look in the catechism, it will tell you the answers quite easily. Okay, let's move on. As I never tire of saying, the essence of the rosary is to focus the mind on the mysteries of our salvation. The incarnation, the passion and death of the Lord, his resurrection and ascension with its effects for redeemed humanity. The 15 mysteries of the rosary therefore are soteriological, that means they're about our salvation and they're succinct. Nothing more is needed if we regard the mysteries of the rosary as just a concise preaching of the gospel of man's salvation through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And this of course, as I said right at the beginning, is a very Dominican outlook because the order of preachers, the Dominicans, was raised up by the Holy Spirit, set up as a response to the Albigensian heresy, which had denigrated the incarnation, denigrated the human body, and despised the goodness of material creation. The Dominican order was founded in 1216 with the express purpose of preaching for the salvation of souls. The rosary therefore recounts how man is saved, how the salvation of souls is affected by Christ, and the rosary proclaims the glorious goal of our final salvation in Christ, united to God, body and soul in heaven. So in the second part of this talk today, we shall meditate on the glorious mysteries of the Holy Rosary, particularly on the Ascension, since last Thursday was Ascension Thursday, even if I know in many countries, they delay the celebration until tomorrow, the Sunday after Ascension Thursday. Last week, I considered the object of prayer. 
which is to grow in love and desire for God and for the things of God. And I touched on St. Thomas Aquinas' wise teaching on how to deal with distractions in prayer because of our human frailties, mindful of setting our intentions on giving our time, our energies, and our needs to God. Now, I'm often asked how best to pray the rosary. And people tell me they've struggled with the rosary and find it difficult. Some have thus given up on saying the rosary. My own experience has also been one of struggle with the rosary and my own mind often wanders. I get distracted or I find myself just going through the paces but not really concentrating, not really able to meditate as best as I like. But I do find that having sacred art before my eyes does help to focus my mind. And nowhere is this more apparent to me than here in my own Rosary Shrine Church in London, where each of the mysteries of the Dominican Rosary, joyful, sorrowful, and glorious, is sculpted and depicted uh, in statuary and in stained glass. And as I walk from one Rosary Chapel to the next, slowly praying the Hail Marys, I have to enter into these distinct chapels that are dedicated to each of the mysteries. It's as though I'm entering the mystery itself. And as I gaze on the sculpture in front of me, depicting each of those mysteries of the rosary, I find myself interacting with the art. The imagination is engaged and the scenes come to life in the mind's eye. This engagement of the imagination and of the intellect is vital, it seems to me, when we meditate on the rosary. My hope in writing and putting together my book, Mysteries Made Visible, is that I can help people to see this and guide them to meditate using images, meditating on the mysteries of salvation. And occasionally I found that music can also help to focus the mind. What I mean by this is we can have a particular mystery, let's say the incarnation, Jesus's birth. And yes, we could listen to a Christmas carol in the background as we are praying that mystery. Or we listen to the carol first, listen to the words, and then we pray the Hail Marys. Or we listen to the music in the background as we are looking upon a sacred image and praying the Hail Marys. Remember, as I said in my earlier answer, the Ten Hail Marys is more about a duration of time, meditating on what God has done for us, rather than about being obsessed with getting every single word correct. In my book, Mysteries Made Visible, then, I have used images taken predominantly from the treasury of sacred art that is found in our churches, at least here in Europe. Mosaics, statues, stained glass windows, altarpieces. I wanted to draw attention to the wonderful artwork that many of our churches are blessed with. Each of these were made by an artist for the glory of God. Each were created with the intent of helping us to focus our prayer and devotion. And by their beauty, which still calls out to so many passers-by and non-believers, sacred art and church buildings have the power to lead us to the one who is, as Gerald Manley Hopkins says, beauty's self and beauty's giver. The photographs used in Mysteries Made Visible and which I'll be using in today's talk were all taken by me and they come from various churches around the world. The photographs used in the book Mysteries Made Visible were selected by members of the Marian devotional movement that's based in North America. All of them are members of the Rosary Confraternity and they often join me in my online rosary every Friday at 8 p.m. London time. And to have them participate in the creation of my book in this way by choosing the images that I had to meditate on is a wonderful work of collaboration. My hope is that this kind of way of praying, what I call a visio divina, so we're used to maybe hearing about lexio divina, which is about um, sacred reading of the word, but well, this is sacred seeing, okay? Visio divina, a kind of theological rumination on a work of sacred art. My hope is that this visio divina 
will help us to pray better and to pray the rosary and meditate upon it. And certainly we will try and do that at the end of today. My hope is that as you look at the images and when you pray the rosary, you will have your own theological reflections as you contemplate the Christian mysteries made visible through sacred art. And indeed, the mysteries of God made visible in the person of Jesus Christ, the word made flesh who dwells among us. As St. John the Evangelist says, we have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. Praying with art then, praying with images, is such an important way to engage children. Some of you might remember uh, a picture Bible. I don't know how many of you had a picture Bible. I certainly did. And even better than a picture Bible, I really enjoyed the, com uh, the Bible in comic form. I don't know, again, if any of you have seen this, but it's, it's worth looking for. Um, it's comic Bibles or Bibles in graphic novel form are extremely popular. You even have comics in manga, um, which, I, which I have been reading as well in French because I've been learning French. Um, these are very useful ways to engage the imagination, to draw you into the story. And many young people, uh, teenagers, uh, young children, are attracted by the images, which are a start, right? They're, when you read a picture book to a kid, you point out the images and not just, you're not just reading the words, but you're helping them to understand the words and understand the story through the pictures that they're looking at. So one of the things that my publisher, the Catholic Truth Society in London and I are working on uh, is a large format, large format picture book, rosary picture book for children an illustrated picture book for, of the rosary for children. This is, we're working on this together with mums, uh, Catholic Mothers UK uh, is working on this with me and with my publisher to try and produce these books. We also want to produce the book uh, with, they told me you can put like a, I don't know what you call it, like a bit of elastic on which there are these little plastic beads, just 10 to help the children to have something to hold and to pray. So it gets the children and young children used to holding something and holding beads whilst they're looking at the images uh, and they're explaining the mysteries of salvation to them. Okay, this is a beginner's level thing to do. And that's what children is age appropriate for children. But another way that I found uh, is to, this is I've done in my school uh, when I've got primary school kids, is uh, I take something like a, a ball, a small ball, right? And I get 10 kids to stand in a line and I hold the first, the ball, and I say, the Our Father, together with the children. Most kids know how to say the Our Father. Then I pass the ball to the first child and the child holds the ball and she says the first half of the Hail Mary. Sometimes you need to help them a bit. And then everybody together responds with the second half, Holy Mary, Mother of God, okay? And then the kid passes the ball to the next child. And the same thing happens again, and then to the next, and the next, and the next. This way, there's also a sense of holding a bead, holding a ball, passing that along. It's fun in that sense. And they're learning that when you pray the rosary, you lead half and the other half, of everyone else joins you and supports you in the other half. And that's how we pray the rosary generally with other people, right? So that's how the children learn that the rosary is made up of 10 Hail Marys. Uh, and when I do it in the church, uh, of course, I have these sculpted uh, pieces of art for them to look at. So I can stand in front of the altarpiece with, let's say, the Annunciation. I explain to them Angel Gabriel coming to Mary. What did Angel Gabriel say to Mary? And they tell me that she's going to be the mother of God or the mother of Jesus. OK, we remember that. And then we play the game with the ball, passing the ball. OK. At that age, all we're trying to do is to help the children to remember that there are such a thing as joyful mysteries, that these are the five joyful mysteries, so that when the kid is trying to remember what the first joyful mystery might be, they can remember that they stood in this chapel or they saw this piece of art. That's how we recall things. We have to use our imaginations to remember things, right? It's a bit like if I told you directions to get to the Rosary Shrine in London, it's really hard for you just from hearing what I'm telling you to find it. 
But once you've made the journey once or twice, and you close your eyes, you can see yourself on the bus or walking there, and you can see what I'm talking to you about, right? So that's what I mean by engaging the imagination. We have to engage our imagination. So when we say to the kids, the first mystery is the enunciation, then immediately this image will come to mind. They remember being in the rosary shrine. They remember seeing the angel, Mary, the Holy Spirit coming down from heaven. They remember all this. And that's how we engage the imagination. It's the same with us, right? So having images is very, very important. Another example that I, another way of praying with children that I use here in the rosary shrine is um, we have a rosary garden and the garden has a path around the statue of Mary with little plaques depicting the luminous mysteries, the mysteries of light. So again, we have a piece of art that you can look at, but more importantly, on the ground, on the path, there are black stones set into a gray path. One big black stone for the Our Father bead, 10 smaller ones for the Hail Mary beads, and one bigger one for the glory bee, okay? So what we do is I get the child to stand on the bead and they say they are father and then they jump to the next bead and say the Hail Mary and they keep jumping. What I call hopscotch. It's like praying hopscotch. I don't know if people know what hopscotch is, but it's this idea of as you take your steps, you're saying a particular prayer. Okay, kids love playing games with, uh, with footsteps, by the way. I used to love doing this. When I was bored, uh, going to the shopping center, I would play a game where I would try to avoid stepping on any lines on the floor. Uh, it's, it's fun to do this sort of thing. And so the children seem to enjoy doing that. If I have lots of children, I get each one of them to stand on a different bead. And then instead of passing the ball, uh, they just, you know, they pray the Hail Mary uh, when it comes to their turn. Okay. So... What am I saying? Use sacred art to engage the imagination, first thing. Second thing, movement, either something that they can play with with their hands, something they can pass, okay, so that they get this idea of saying the Hail Mary with other people. This is how we engage children. And you can do this as a family. If you're blessed to have more than one child in your family, then you can have more fun with them playing these games. Okay, but do use art. And nowadays we have such a ready access to art through, the, through our computers, right? You can find the sacred art. In fact, I have a collection on my Flickr page, um, which I'm gonna put the link in there now, okay? And you can then Google, look for the right image that you want for the mystery you want. Um, and sorry, this has gone to Debbie. I'm gonna send to everybody. Uh, okay, here's my Flickr page now in the chat box, okay? And you'll see there a collection of sacred art. Over uh, 16,000, 16 photographs for you to look at of saints and the sacred art and sacred uh, images, the ascension of our Lord and so on and so forth, all the different mysteries. It can help you collect them together and you can put them on your iPad and you can flick your iPad as you're praying the rosary, or you can, if you're old fashioned, you can print it out online, yep, sorry, print it out on your computer, right? Print it with your printer, and then you can have a collection of images for you to look at, okay? So that's one thing I would recommend. So some people ask me about praying together as a family. How do we do this? Well, as I say, uh, get the children to help you choose art, you know? So go online with your child, look for the sacred art with them. Obviously make sure that the site is safe and go with them and choose pictures that they want to use. Something that draws their attention. That's one way to engage them. Or maybe you can do art together. All the children can draw the artwork, can draw the mysteries. So what you might do is you read the Bible first with them, read the passage of our Lord's resurrection and ask them to think, discuss with them. You know, what might it look like? What do you think the empty tomb was like? Show them pictures of what to, uh, garden tombs looked like at the time of Jesus. Show them pictures of the Holy Sepulcher now in Jerusalem. You know, really engage their imagination and then ask them if they'd like to draw, to draw them together. You can lead the way. Maybe if you're a good artist yourself or you feel confident enough, draw with them. Okay. So all the members of the family, teenagers can do that. Maybe they can take photographs even. Right? Some of your 
older children nowadays, everyone has a phone as well. They can take photographs that will help them to express the different mysteries of the rosary. But of course, first they, the kids have to understand what those mysteries are, which is why the Bible is important. You begin with the Bible always. And then perhaps you can make, make or buy, but make I think is better, a large rosary. And when I mean a large rosary, I mean one that has 15 decades. Right. Sometimes you can buy these huge rosaries, which are given to statues of Our Lady, or they sometimes see, I see them hanging up on the wall of people's homes in the Philippines. It's quite popular. Buy a large rosary or make a rosary. You can make using papier mache um, or other materials. If you're really skilled, you can even do it with wood. But, you know, find a way to be creative, make a rosary. And then when you're praying the rosary together, the whole family is connected through this big rosary. And everyone just moves along 10 beads at their own part of the rosary, but you're praying together, holding the same rosary. This is my family rosary. How beautiful, imagine, if you imagine uh, you have a rosary like that and you're, you know, you're praying together. You can probably buy wooden beads online with a hole in it and you can sort of string it up together. And if their beads are big enough, just think you can even paint it. And so that way, young children can be involved too. It doesn't have to be painted very, very nicely, but just has lots of color and they can paint those beads. And then you've got a painted rosary that you use together as your family rosary. So think of activities that you can do to engage the children's imagination. And so that this rosary is something that they own as a family, something that you're proud of having as a family. Okay, so play the rosary together as a family like that. Don't make it just about, oh, let's sit down and kneel here and let's just say these words. If you're only going to use words, I can assure you, everyone gets very bored. Okay, so art and imagination is essential to prayer. Okay. It's now, nine, it's now 10 o'clock my time, so we have a half an hour. What I'm going to do now is part two of the talk. I'm going to lead you through uh, some artwork. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the glorious mysteries of the rosary. We're going to look at 50, uh, five works of art, and then we will pray the rosary meditating on the ascension. Okay, so we're going to look at the art first, and then we're going to pray the second glorious mystery, the ascension. Okay, so let me just uh, share my screen. happening. Okay. Can everyone see uh, an image of say, Christ and Mary Magdalene? If you can see it, just put your hand up. Yeah, it's come through. Lovely. Okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first glorious mystery is the resurrection. So this fresco is by the Dominican friar and artist, Blessed John of Fiesole, who is the patron saint of artists. He is more commonly known as Fra Angelico. In 1439, Fra Angelico began to paint scenes from the Passion of Christ and of certain mysteries of the Rosary inside the individual monastic cells, that means bedrooms, of the Dominican convent of San Marco in Florence, where he lived. We're looking into one of those cells in this picture. And this shows us the importance of sacred art in the prayer and contemplative study of the Dominican friars of that time. Art is a stimulus to the preaching activity of the Dominican friars. Looking through the arch doorway into the cell, we are invited to share in the contemplation of those Dominican friars who once prayed and slept in this room. This medieval window from Chartres Cathedral depicts the mysteries of Eastertide from Ascension Sun, Sun, from Easter Sunday, which we see on the left here, to Pentecost Sunday. That's the whole of Eastertide, therefore. And at the center is this wonderful depiction of Christ's ascension, when we see both heaven above and earth below. See the disciples all looking on 
and the clouds opening up, Christ taken into heaven, and you just see his feet. So we're going to be meditating on this uh, later on, shortly. The third glorious mystery is the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And this is a photograph of the Pentecost Chapel here in the Rosary Shrine in London. And we see seven rays descending from the Holy Spirit. That's the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit descending upon us. Tongues of fire going up, uh, of falling from heaven, if you like, a reminder of what happened at Pentecost. So my church is, uh, has a stone altarpiece like this for every single mystery of the rosary. So this is the third glorious mystery. The fourth glorious mystery is the assumption of Our Lady into heaven. And this is a terracotta altarpiece from the workshop of Andrea della Robbia in Tuscany, dating to 1485, or 1525, somewhere in that period. It's now housed in the Victorian Albert Museum in London. I just want to point out one thing here, which is the blue color. Blue is often associated with Our Lady nowadays, partly because it is the color of the sky uh, and of heaven, and Our Lady is queen of heaven. Um, but if you know your Bible, you would you rightly think it's a bit strange to have blue associated with Mary because Mary is not clothed with the sky. She's not clothed, clothed with the heavens. She's clothed with the sun, right? As the book of Apocalypse tells us, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown, and a crown of 12 stars. That's how Mary is depicted in the Bible. So why did they choose blue? They chose blue because in the late Middle Ages, blue was the most valuable and precious color that you could find in an artist's palette. Because the color blue, especially of this kind of color, comes from um, lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli, then as now, is commonly found or, or most easily found in Afghanistan, mined in Afghanistan. So imagine in the Middle Ages, this precious material is mined in Afghanistan, has to, be, has to travel many, many, many miles uh, quite perilously to get to Europe, where it is then ground up into pigment, uh, bound up with, with various glues and oils in order to be applied to a painting. It was extremely expensive. And this color came to be known as uh, ultramarine, ultramarine, which literally means coming from across the sea. Okay, and that's where the color came from. It came from this precious mineral, lapis lazuli, from across the seas, that came from Afghanistan. And that's why, because it was the most precious and the most costly, people began to associate it with Mary, because she is the most precious of all God's creatures. Okay, until then, the backdrop of, a, of an icon would be painted in gold. As you often see today, icons are painted in gold. Why gold? not because gold is the most pricely, although partly that, but because gold doesn't corrupt, okay? Unlike silver and other metals, gold doesn't tarnish. And that's why gold is so precious, because it doesn't tarnish. I don't know about you, but I hate polishing things, uh, get tired of polishing things. So nowadays I've been taking some brass candlesticks and to the, to the workshop to be polished. And after they polish the candlesticks, I say to them, how much will it cost me to plate it all in gold? And they said, they laugh and they say, why do you want to plate it in gold? I said, well, because I don't want to polish them. <laughs> and you plate it in gold, they don't tarnish. So I don't have to plate, I don't have to polish them. So gold is valuable because it doesn't tarnish. And because it doesn't tarnish, it doesn't corrupt. It became a symbol of the spiritual life because the spirit is incorruptible, unlike the flesh, right? We all know that our bodies get sick and our bodies get sick and they get old and they die, so they're corruptible. 
bodies are corruptible. The spirit is incorruptible, doesn't die. We have an immortal soul. And so spiritual things and heavenly things were thought to be incorruptible and gold represented that incorruptibility and that eternal lastingness of heaven. Okay, so that's why gold is used in art. And my final piece of art for you to look at is the fifth glorious mystery, the coronation of Our Lady as Queen of Heaven and the glory of all the saints. This painting is in the Louvre Museum in Paris, and it is also painted by Blessed Fra Angelico, painted around 1434-1435 for the convent, the Dominican convent in Fiesole, where Fra Angelico himself had entered the Dominican order. Unlike later images, which simply focus on Our Lady's coronation, these earlier medieval inspired images of the coronation of Mary are more ecclesiological, meaning they're about the church. Mary is shown surrounded. In fact, they're crowding in all the hosts of heaven, angels and saints, because Mary is the queen of saints, but she is also mother of the church, mother of all the redeemed, as we said in previous weeks. And that's why we contemplate uh, the works that God has done for humankind by looking at what he has done for Mary. He has crowned her with his grace and given her a share in his glory. This is what we mean by divinization. This is what we mean by God becoming man, that we share in the triumph of Christ, in the triumph of his grace, that we share in his glory, that we are totally transformed by grace so that we love as God loves. That is our goal. Through the gift of her holy rosary, Mary comes to help us contemplate and to know the mysteries of our Christian faith so that we can grow in hope of forgiveness for sin, in hope of salvation through Jesus Christ, and in hope in eternal life through Christ who died for us and who crowns us with salvation. Contemplating the mysteries of salvation, let us grow in love for the God who first loved us. Because as St. Thomas Aquinas said, to excite our love towards God, there was no more powerful way than that the word of God through whom all things were made should assume our human nature in order to restore it. Because the strongest way God can show how much he loves man was by his willing to become man for his salvation. For nothing can provoke love more than to know that one is loved. The rosary is a contemplation with Mary of the love of God. And as we grow in love for God, so we shall follow Christ more closely. Because as Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home in him. God made his home, first of all, in Mary. When she said, Fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum. Let it be done to me according to your word. Her total trust in God, her great love for God, made her a fitting and worthy dwelling place for the Blessed Trinity and for Christ to take flesh in her womb. And now Christ wills to take flesh in you, in us Christians, when by grace we also can say to God, Fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum. Let your word be made flesh in my life, in my actions, in my own flesh. Amen. So let us return now to pray together the second glorious mystery, the ascension of our Lord into heaven. Let me take you through a visio divina, a reading of this sacred image. At first glance, if we look at this image of Christ, it looks as though he is at the altar celebrating mass. But on closer examination, we see that in fact, in his left hand, he is holding not a host, but a globe, a symbol of all created things, and indeed all created time, because we see here alpha, and omega, 
the beginning and the end of all things and of all time. However, I don't think it's accidental. I don't think it's unintentional that Christ should look as though he is saying mass. Because now in our time here on earth, it is through the mass that Jesus Christ is present to us, present in the world. If we pay attention to the text of the Acts of the Apostles, which is written by St. Luke, we're told that Jesus is taken up, taken from the sight of his apostles. But at the same time, at the end of St. Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, Behold, I am with you always, even to the close of the age. So although Jesus cannot be seen by our eyes, that doesn't mean he is absent from us or absent from the church or absent from our world. Rather, Christ is present to us. And indeed, Christ gives himself to us to dwell in us through the mass, through Holy Communion. The presence of the round white disc that Jesus holds in his left hand points to this. Indeed, Jesus is the host. He is the Alpha and the Omega. It is Christ himself. This focus on the Eucharist is important, especially as we contemplate the glorious mysteries of the Rosary. Because as St. Thomas Aquinas says, the Eucharist is the pledge, the promise of our future glory. It is through this sacrament of the Eucharist that we become divinized, that God, com that God works in us to complete the circle of St. Athanasius's quote, God has become man so that man might become God. Hence, Pope Leo XIII said, in the frail and perishable body of that divine host, which is the immortal body of Christ, Christ implants a principle of resurrection, a seed of immortality, which one day must germinate. For Jesus has said, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. But what are the apostles, and therefore the church, left staring at? They're staring at the feet of Christ. And yet consider these words of St. Paul, calling us to preach this startlingly good news of our divinization. The fact that man can now become God because God has first become man. We are called to preach this. And this is how St. Paul puts it. How are men to call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? And how can men preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. By looking at the feet of Jesus then, we remember that we have been given feet so that we can go out to preach the good news. Therefore, at his ascension, the last words of Christ, his final commandment to us was this, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now especially at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the 
hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it's now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Father. So we have some time for some questions or comments. Thank you to um, Patricia Yap, who pointed out that uh, in Numbers 4, 4 to 6, the Ark of the Covenant was covered with a blue veil. Uh, I just have to look that up. Just not that I don't trust you, but just to be sure. For any questions, please uh, feel free to chime in. Uh, put your hand up as you know before you and introduce yourself, please. Okay, thank you. Just put your hands up if you have any questions to ask, Father, or you can write in the chat. Otherwise, just raise your hand and you can unmute yourself then. Father, along um, in the chat boxes, there are questions asking for whether or not you have a, any visual, audio visual recordings of the meditation with art for all the mysteries. No, I don't. Okay, there we go. Um, there's a question from Julian. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, this is to Father Lawrence. Lots of people seem to have a lot of different questions and some I realize are not related to the cause at all. Now, this might seem like a very big question, but do you have any statistics telling us like how many Bible scholars there are like in our own church or in Malaysia or worldwide? Does the church have this kind of statistic? 
And is there a place where we can throw questions so that priests can answer? As in the previous sessions, you mentioned you yourself are not a Bible scholar. So in case we got any questions, we can send it to maybe some central email or some system. And you know, our questions can be addressed rather than we throw it to you. Then they come and say, oh, the priest says this is not related. Please send it to the church. Then if someone they don't know, we have the church not answering the question or no one seems to know. Is there a statistic showing who are the Bible scholars? Who can answer the questions? Thank you. Well, well no, because that's not what Bible scholars are for, right? I mean, if you're a Muslim and you want to settle a, a dispute in the, in the Quran, you might go to the Imams who are supposed to be experts in, in the sacred text and who can settle a dispute. Since we are Christians, we do not worship the Bible. We do not worship the, the Bible as the source of all truth. We worship the person of Jesus Christ. So having a body of scripture scholars isn't going to settle anything. The church has never looked to a group of scripture scholars to settle any question. That's what the bishops in union with the Pope are for. The magisterium of the church settles questions of theology, not scripture scholars. After all, if there's anything that I learned in seminary, is that if you have one scripture scholar who says one opinion, you have another one who says the direct opposite, okay? So scripture scholars are of no use whatsoever if you wanna settle a question, that's what the Pope is for. I suggest that if you want to know the teaching of the Catholic Church, you should read the catechism. So before you do any further looking around and asking questions of priests, please read the catechism. If you read it before, read it again. And if you don't understand the catechism, you can look at the compendium of the catechism, which breaks it down in a question and answer format. If you prefer, you can read UCAT, which was written for by young people for young people. There are whole different ways of reading the catechism because the church begs us to know our catechism. Because if you did, if we know our catechism and we are helped to understand it, and yes, you can ask your priests hopefully to help you understand the catechism if you need to, but if we do that, I can assure you, none of the questions that have been asked so far would have been asked. All your answers are there. And that's how I learned it too. I read the catechism. I used to read it every night before I go to bed. Just a question or two. Okay. Thank you, Father. There is a question from Betty. Hi, Father. Why is the Fatima prayer not said after each decade and after the glory be at the LOM meeting? Legion of Mary? Yeah, it must be an LOM yes, Legion, Legion of Mary. Mary. Because the Legion <laughs> of Mary says that nothing can be added to the rosary, not even what Our Lady asked for. That is what the concilium decided. I am not in charge of concilium and I'm nothing to do with the Legion of Mary in that, in that rank. So if you have a question about the Legion of Mary, ask concilium, don't ask me. Yes, that's true. Um, okay, the other one, I can't unmute. Uh, this is Frida. Frida, you want to unmute? I'll try and unmute you, Frida. Unmute, can you ask to unmute? Can you unmute? Can you just press your, you can't? Okay, I've got it now. Ah, yes, okay. I, I got a message saying the host doesn't allow me to unmute, you know. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm one of those who, like you fathers, really struggled over this last seven years on uh, doing the meditations and the recitation together. Um, just as you just did while you were reciting, I was meditating. Now, is that, is that acceptable to have a recording of the rosary? Yes, um, while it's, more than, the it's more than acceptable. I, I encourage you to do that. So, I mean, I could meditate and also just sort of like, you know, since you said that we don't have to concentrate on the Hail Mary, then yeah. I could have just listen it as a background. Um, as a yes, background. You, can. you can, yes. You know, many years ago, uh, about 30 years ago, maybe 20 over years ago, Pope John Paul II uh, released a recording of him praying the rosary in Latin. Hmm. I loved it. It was a great hit. They had some beautiful singing in between the, the mysteries and he was just praying the rosary and you're praying with him. Uh, you know, there's, we're very, as I say, we're very lucky nowadays that you have all these audio recordings on YouTube and so on. You know, if someone asked if I have a presentation with images, just look for it on YouTube. Someone has already done it with beautiful images 
and you, they pray the rosary. And you can even get some where they only pray half and then you say the other half, you know. So there are many different formats that are available. Many great apostles of the rosary are out there and they've produced many things to help us to pray the rosary through recordings and so on. So please do use them. Do so use I, them. I don't need to recite every Hail Mary, right? I, mean, I can meditate while you're reciting, for instance. I'll yes. just listen to you, yeah. Yes, it's possible. As long as you're saying in your heart. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There's another question from Pauline Ng. If you are just about to say the rosary or any prayer and something angry or something that you won't say that makes uh, the prayers properly, should you continue saying the prayer? Well, if uh, I'm taking this to mean that, you know, if you're saying the rosary or you're ang and you become angry or you get ill feelings in your heart or whatever it is, should you continue saying the prayer? Well, yes, the worst thing you can do if you're angry is to stop praying. Uh, the worst thing you can do if you're angry or feeling anything bad is to stop praying, okay? Prayer is talking to God and it's about receiving from God the graces we need as his children. The one who wants you to stop praying and therefore stop talking to God the one who wants to separate you from God is the devil. So why would you stop praying if you need to pray? If you're angry about something or some situation, you need to pray. So keep praying. You know, one of the funniest things, uh, funny things I read about in the spiritual masters is say, you know, there's a thing called a chedia. A chedia is the noonday devil, sometimes called this, which means you feel tired or lethargic. You know, like it's a very hot day in Malaysia. And if I said to you, let's go for a walk in Lake Gardens, uh, you'll be wilting in the heat, right? Now, for the Desert Fathers, that feeling of wilting in the heat, not really wanting to do anything, is what they call the noonday devil. This is a special, a demon who torments the Christian and makes them feel like, oh, I don't feel like praying, don't feel like doing anything. It's all too much to pray, you know, and they want to stop us from praying. And the answer of the fathers when they're asked, you know, what should we do when we're afflicted by the noonday demon who wants to stop us from praying? <laughs> the answer is, that's when you should pray. So if your question is, what should I do when I can't pray? The, fathers are, the answer of the desert fathers is, when you can't pray, you should pray. <laughs> so whether you like it or not, whether you feel worthy or not, the answer is to pray, okay? At all times, your answer is to pray. So long as prayer means directing your thoughts to God, connecting with God, okay? As I always say for Catholics, you know, when we want to talk to God, we pick up the phone. And how do we know we're picking up the phone? We make the sign of the cross. That for a Catholic means picking up the phone and communicating. You know why? Because at the end of your prayer, we always make the sign of the cross again because that's when we put down the phone. If we don't put the phone down, then we haven't finished the conversation, right? It's a joke, but some people might get it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Next one I see here. Is there a posture we have to follow when we pray the rosary? Is it okay to pray the rosary lying down? I've been asked this before and I said yes. Okay, next. Okay, Father, there's just one from Anna Young. And okay. that's addressed to me. Could you please email me all five sessions of teaching notes and recordings? I believe that Agnes has been uh, sending out all the recordings and the teachings. So if you have not got it, could you please, uh, I don't know whether... Check and, your junk mail. Yeah, check, check your junk mail because uh, Agnes has been doing that. Yep, all these. All right, the next one, Father. Um in the book secrets of the holy rosary by saint louis marie de montfort the crown of roses is mentioned please elaborate what is the crown of roses you? well if you're reading the secret of the holy rosary then saint louis marie de montfort tells you himself what the crown of roses is about right i mean um i can't really elaborate on something like that in a short answer but suffice to say that he links each prayer of the Hail Mary to a rose. A rose is a spiritual, something of beauty, but a spiritual offering that we make to God. Uh, a crown of roses is then, you know, many spiritual acts of love that is offered to God. And as I said, 
the goal of prayer is to increase love in our soul. Therefore, you can see why the rosary is regarded as a crown of roses, because we're offering to God one beautiful act of love. Okay, in short, that's what I would say. Uh, Our Lady of the Matters Blue, okay. Do we make a sign of cross at the glory be? Um, you don't have to, but then again, <laughs> nobody's going to blame you if you did. But I can tell you that as a priest, if I'm leading the rosary, I won't do that because if I do, then everybody will do it. Um, yes, let's let's on. I'm going to make a point about praying the rosary in Latin because. Uh, there are some people, particularly young people, who think that praying the rosary in Latin is somehow better. Um, I don't think it is necessarily better. You know, the most beautiful rosary is the one that is prayed with true devotion in the heart. Um, and if I thought that I was better than other people, if I think this is, uh, if I pray the rosary in a prideful way because I can say it in, in Latin and no one else can, or I was asked earlier this week about singing the rosary, well, if singing the rosary somehow makes it a cause for pride, then obviously it's not going to be a good idea to do that. I just want to make a very simple observation that when Our Lady came down to earth to teach people to pray the rosary, she did this, for example, at Fatima with the little, the three shepherd children, and she did this also at Lourdes to Saint Bernadette. We must remember that Our Lady spoke to the children and prayed the rosary with the children, both at Fatima and at Lourdes, in their local mother tongue. And I think that's very beautiful, that our most perfect and blessed mother, the mother of God, who is also our mother, when she comes to earth, she prays with us in our mother tongue. She prays the rosary with us in our mother tongue. She doesn't pray in Latin, she doesn't pray in Greek, she doesn't pray in Aramaic indeed, which is her own mother tongue, but she prays in our mother tongue. So although praying in Latin is good if you're a Roman Catholic because Latin is the official language of the church, and because Latin is to be revered as the ancient language of the church, I would also say that when it comes to the rosary, let us always keep an eye on our Blessed Mother's example and not despise her actions. She chooses to pray in the mother tongue. And so we shouldn't think that's a lesser thing to do. Okay. The last time I said something like this on Twitter, a lot of tw what I call twits, people who don't know how to read, uh, said that I hated Latin and I don't promote Latin. Well, that's a stupid thing to say because as anyone will know, uh, I say the mass in Latin every Sunday in my parish. So next, when did the prayer of St. Michael become part of the rosary? It's not. Is it integral part of the rosary? No. Is it necessary to give a small narrative of the mystery before reciting the rosary? It's not necessary, but it might be desirable in some places and sometimes. For the record, when I pray the rosary here in the rosary shrine, I sometimes give a meditation if the spirit moves me. I sometimes don't, most of the time I don't. And when I pray it online on a Friday, I certainly don't. So it depends. It's not necessary though. If a person has been praying the rosary regularly, then develops dementia, is the rosary a prayer that the person with dementia can still remember? Well, um, you know, I think that's a question to ask a physician. But uh, my own personal experience of people with dementia and, and certainly of praying with the elderly at home when I go and visit them is they can often remember the prayers of the rosary. You know, they, they often are the last things to go um, if it has been so deeply ingrained in them through the, from, the, from childhood. Um, but I think your question, Anne, or three Anne, is, <laughs> is more about, um, you know, it's really more about the about dementia and how it develops and its symptoms rather than about, about, about my expertise, which is about prayer. But my, my experience is that people with dementia do pray the rosary and can manage to do so. 
um, yeah. Any other questions at this point? Because it's uh, ten thirty-six, my time. Yes, I think Father has got a tight schedule ahead. So I think uh, if there's no more, what we're going to do now is we're going to invite um, Daryl. I think Daryl is going to. Uh, she's from the Malaysian organizers. Yep, and she just wants to say a thank you note to everybody. She is from uh, Saint Ignatius Church in Petaling Jaya. I think. If I'm not sure, from Malaysia, I know. Uh, Daryl? I, yeah. I see that Mildred has put a hand up. Uh, I don't know whether it's been a long time. Mildred, is it Mildred Lopez? Yes. Put a hand yes. Up. Just, I'll take that as the last question and then we'll go to Daryl, okay? Okay. Mildred, yes. You can you unmute yourself now? I pressed you already, Mildred. Mildred, can you just unmute? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, my my thing could not unmute earlier. Yes. Okay. I'm I'm actually asking a question that was posted but not answered, which I need to know the answer. Uh, Father, you have your book Mysteries Made Visible. Yes. Is is there a channel that we can order from online, yes. where the proceeds go? To your community. Oh. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> no. Uh, if, if you order online, it will go to CTS, uh, which is the publisher. But the Catholic Truth Society is a charity in its own right. Uh, and it is the uh, one of the oldest publishers of Catholic books. And it has the distinct title of being Publishers to the Holy See. Uh, I'm a huge fan and a supporter of their work. It's a great honor to be published by the CTS. Um, and, and so I, I don't have any problem with you ordering from them directly. Obviously, if you order from Amazon, then uh, no, we don't get any of the proceeds either. The only way that we get anything is if you buy from the Rosary Shrine. Um, and unfortunately, because I don't have uh, a huge group of volunteers and so on. I can't post the books out. Um, you have to come here and physically pick them up. Um, so uh, a, a donation uh, to the Rosary Shrine, which you can do online, uh, is probably the best way for us to receive anything. Um, and then when you come, hopefully at some point, we can give you a copy of the book, a signed copy. Thank but you, thanks, Father. Thank you for your interest and thank you for your help. Thank you, Father. Anyone else? Okay, so let's, uh, can we invite Daryl to? Yes, Daryl. Daryl, where's Daryl? Please unmute me, she says. <laughs> okay, uh -huh. let me try. Okay, can you unmute her? Because you're also co-host. I, I'm trying to, but I can't find her. Let me see. Exactly, I can't find her too. That's, <laughs> I'm trying to find her too, because <laughs> there's so many people here. Um, they, uh, yeah. yeah, I found her. Okay. okay, good. You got better eyesight than me. Okay, Daryl's unmuted. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Father. I've been muted for so long. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now you're unmuted. Praise God for sending Father Liu to us. Alleluia to you and to all the people who has made it to participate. I am Daryl from the formation team of uh, St. Ignatius Church, Pataling Jaya, Malaysia. On behalf of our parish priest, Father Lawrence Ng, we would like to thank you, Father Liu. And and Faye, who has made this possible jointly together with our Malaysian formation team. And I would like to express our thanks to all the people who has helped in making this possible 
for everyone to participate on Zoom. Special thanks, of course, to Father Liu, to Anne and Faye from the uh, Mercy of Motion in Singapore for hosting this on Zoom. For Anthony Tan, who has initiated the contact with Father Liu, and many others like Suchu, Julian, and those who are helping in the background, promoting this program through Zoom, uh, through their WhatsApp. And we also would like to thank the people of Formation Team, St. Ignatius Church, especially our secretary, who has been working so hard sending out information, video records and everything promptly to all the participants. And to everyone who has made the donations to St. Ignatius Church, at the end of this session, our church will send your donation to Father Liu in London. And again, uh, on behalf of our priests, I thank everyone for your participation and for your effort to put this thing together. We should give a praise and alleluia to our Lord and Mother Mary for this wonderful session that Father Liu has given us. Thank you, praise God. Thank you very much, Daryl. So I think we've reached the end of the day and yeah. <laughs> the road yeah, for all of us. Thank you so very much. Um, I say, I suppose at this moment now, it's over to you, Father Lawrence. I know you've been speaking, but any last words to us? Any goodbye? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, well, what can I say except to encourage you to pray the rosary and pray it every day. Uh, please join the Rosary Confraternity. Um, and uh, in fact, I can quote uh, Johan Leong on the chat box who says, remember, remember to say your rosary daily. Please say the rosary in your preferred language and not necessarily in Latin. So I think that's, uh, that's I agree with that. But pray the rosary, whatever it may be, and pray from your heart and pray as you can. Pray as you can. OK, so we start with simple baby steps. Some of us, uh, I'm still you will need taking baby steps and like little toddlers we sometimes fall a little bit so pick yourself up with god's grace and carry on the most important thing is not to stop praying not to give up but keep going okay it's like the stations of the cross jesus fell and he still carried on right you need his grace to carry on i just want to answer a final question which uh, just to clarify i guess um regarding the luminous mysteries the mysteries of light saying that it was something added later uh, not intended by our Blessed Mother among the 15 mysteries, joyful, sorrowful, and glorious. Um, I mean, yes, I mean, that is true. But we must remember, as I talked about the development of the rosary, even the idea of there being joyful, sorrowful, and glorious, uh, was it directly revealed by Mary to St. Dominic? Not quite clear if it was. Uh, the devising of it, and certainly the way it's written, joyful, sorrowful, and glorious with these particular uh, sets of mysteries as we know them uh, is something that only uh, crystallized in the time of Saint Pope St. Pius V, the great Dominican Pope of the Rosary, who uh, used the Rosary, prayed the Rosary to win the battle at Lepanto, right? Uh, that's why the Dominican Rosary with the joyful, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries is so very popular. It's because of victory at Lepanto, because of the promotion of Pope Pius V. And every Pope I hope will promote and pray the rosary. I'm very happy for that. I'm very happy that Pope St. John Paul the Great decided to promote the rosary so strongly. And he saw fit to suggest as an option, as an option without displacing the traditional 15 mysteries, he decided, uh, he suggested that we pray these luminous mysteries as well. It's not obligatory. It's entirely up to your devotion. No devotion actually is obligatory. It's entirely up to our love whether we want to do it or not. 
And at Pope St. John Paul II was very respectful of the 15 mysteries of the rosary. And he didn't say that it has to be displaced or that it should be replaced or that he was trumping Our Lady's commands or anything like that. So there's no need to denigrate them. But I think that as Roman Catholics, uh, we must have a loyalty to the Holy Father. We must uh, respond to the invitations of the magisterium of the church. And we must see that in a saintly Pope like John Paul II, there is a movement of the Holy Spirit. And so it's in obedience and in filial obedience, which every Catholic ought to have, filial obedience to the Pope, that we respond as well as we possibly can. And as promoter general of the rosary, I have responded to our Holy Father's invitation to pray the luminous mysteries by including it in my book, Mysteries Made Visible. And I include in there my theological interpretation of why and how we can pray the luminous mysteries in conjunction with or in, uh, in parallel with the traditional 15, okay? As I said before, if you watch the videos, you'll see me say it, that the luminous mysteries are about the sacramental life of the church because it is through the sacraments that we live out the central mysteries of the joyful, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries of the rosary, okay? In other words, the Paschal mystery of Christ, what he has done and what he has accomplished for us, we appropriate that and we live that in our life, we're divinized by those mysteries through the sacraments of the church. And some theologians have said to me that that's a very good insight because we are living at an age where the sacraments are not thought to be that important or thought to be merely symbolic, but the sacraments actually sanctify and divinize us. And, thank, and the second thing is that we're living at an age where the church is becoming split up. People are very individualistic in their faith. They want to do what they want to do without paying attention to the church, to the wider community of the church, and to what uh, the popes are leading us and how the popes are leading us. Now, at the moment, I'm catechizing a young man. And what as I'm catechizing him, I'm realizing that you know, what sets Catholics apart from all other types of Christians is that we are ecclesial. We belong to the church. We think according to the mind of the entire church. And I don't mean the church alive here and now or the life of the church in a particular part of the world, in Malaysia or whatever. I mean the church, meaning 2,000 years of our Christian lived experience and history and tradition, okay? To think according to the church, sentire cum ecclesia, is to think broadly. And that's why I don't like it when we concentrate on doing this particular thing or do that particular thing. All these little particularities don't matter because in the 2000 year history of the church, we have all prayed as best as we can. So long as our focus in prayer is to grow in love for God. The scrupulous attention to details sometimes are just that, scruples and they keep us from really praying. As B. Jarrett, the great English Dominican said, you know, when we concentrate on the rules and methods of praying so much, then he says, we become bored and no doubt so does God. It's <laughs> not prayer, it's not prayer, okay? Uh, and the question about the seven sorrowful rosary, whatever that is, um, that is a question to ask the Franciscans. They made it up, you can ask them. I don't know much about it. Okay, I'm the promoter of the of the Dominican Rosary, and that's about all I have time to talk about. Thank you very much. Thank on that you. note, on that note, we are going to end. I think. Thank you so much for all your time. I'm so grateful and so impressed by all those who uh, have joined us live. Uh, those who I'm sure are watching the videos as well, um, and for those who have written in and asked their questions. Uh, and who, who have listened and so on and so forth. All the silent spectators as well, who I hope are praying quietly at home. But thank you ever so much. I am very grateful for all that you've given, uh, but above all for your time and for your love and for your prayers. Please pray for me, for my work as promoted General of the Rosary and pray for our community here in London who are doing Our Lady's work of leading souls to Jesus Christ, who is the universal savior. Thank you. So together, let us just say a Hail Mary for Father.
that the Lord will continue to bless him. I don't know how to unmute everybody, but I'm just going to press on everybody. And so I, you just unmute yourself as you go along, okay? I'll just press on you. Cannot more um, people are pinned. Uh, can you all unmute yourself? Because I'm just going to unmute. Us unmute. So if you all just unmute yourself, and then together we shall pray for Father that the Lord will continue to bless him and watch over him. Okay. Okay, so let's together pray that the Lord will bless him with good health and continue to give him this wisdom of teaching. And also we pray for the Dominican order that God will send him young men to join the order. Let's say it together. It doesn't matter. Hail Mary. Hail Mary. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as it was in the beginning, now shall be, now shall be, world without end. The beginning is now, and it shall be, world without end. Amen. So goodbye, Father, and thank you again for everything. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye